Welcome to the Product Design Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Coolen, founder of UX Cabin, where we create world-class web and mobile apps. I'm excited to bring you a behind-the-scenes look into the lives of some of the most interesting and talented people in product design. We'll get strategic advice on how they got to where they are today and things they wish they would have known earlier in their career. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for hanging out with us on this episode of the Product Design Podcast. Today, we have Steven Steiner with us. He is a career coach for designers in San Francisco. Steven, thank you so much for uh, coming on. Yeah, happy to. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Cool. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, definitely. So I consider myself a designer by trade and a coach at art. And what I do now as a career coach for designers, we can get into, but really my story comes from being a designer my entire career, primarily in the UX space. And as I worked my way up the corporate ladder about a year ago, I realized that at a certain height, I didn't care about all of the logistics of management as much as I enjoyed just the aspect of being able to help other people level up and love what they do day to day. So beyond being a designer and winning awards, I also was always kind of teaching or coaching or mentoring on the side. And I've chosen to leave corporate America in order to pursue this more full time because it's simply more rewarding and enjoyable for me and what I want to do in my career. Sure, sure. So what was your path into user experience? Yeah, awesome question. So my path was actually through college. I got a degree that's called informatics. And don't worry, my parents still think I made that up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but really, it was through the School of Library Science. So when you think of a traditional library in a brick and mortar building that had to store stuff in a filing cabinet, Taking that digital, I was in the fifth graduating class of the program at the time from the University of Washington. And what we did was looked at how does data get stored into a database? And then how do you create an interface that allows people to retrieve that information? And I really got into thinking of the mental model of a user and how might they go about trying to find stuff that is a screen so you don't have the same environment as you would walking into a physical location. That's a really interesting degree to go into. How'd you know that you kind of wanted to do that? So what I did as a freshman at college is I went around and talked to a bunch of upperclassmen, like juniors and seniors that I met. And I was like, what are you doing and why? Because traditionally, when you come out of K through 12, you're just like, oh, there's just a standard degrees that exist. So as I went through and basically did my own stakeholder interviews or research, I was like, what are you doing and why? And I came across one person specifically who talked to me about the program. And I was really interested in it, knowing that I didn't really like to code, so I didn't want to go the computer science route. And the business school wasn't technical enough for me. So I kind of found that sweet spot of like, I got a degree in informatics, a minor in sales, because I figure everything has some sort of a sales or marketing slant to it, even if you want to tell your friends what movie you're going to or convincing them to go to a specific movie. So that's where I found into it. And then I just started going down that path of like, I love solving puzzles. So being able to get paid to basically solve puzzles all day long is fantastic. Very cool. Very cool. So what happened after college? Yeah. So after college, I got into UX in the agency space. So moving from Seattle to Kansas City, coming with the Seattle mentality, I was able to get a job at an agency called VML. And they're one of the largest marketing agencies that exist or digital agencies in general. And that's where I really came in as just a kid who was young and hungry and curious. Found some fantastic mentors there, really tried to stay open and learn. And I spent some time there before moving again, but I spent 10 years of my career in the agency world. Saw a lot of really diverse things, got a lot of really cool projects in a way that you realize that some of the biggest corporations in America are just hiring agencies in a way to where they don't trust their in-house team. So you get exposure to a lot of stuff and I really loved it. And then once I kind of realized where I was and my skill set and what my strengths were, I capitalized on that to continue to grow my career. And then I would say about four years ago or five years ago, I went in-house and did work at different in-house teams because larger companies were realizing that The agency world was profitable with that model. So why can't they recreate it in-house? So designing teams are starting to be built in larger corporations. And I did some of that for a while as well. Very cool. I'm curious as to like how you fell into that initial 
yeah, UX job. Did you know that's like what you wanted to do? Did an opportunity just kind of fall into your lap? How did that whole thing go down? Uh, I wouldn't say I knew exactly what the industry was, but I knew what I enjoyed doing. So UX designer was the first job title. I've held different job titles of like information architect, interaction designer, UX designer, UX architect, product designer. And I say that because my job day to day hasn't really changed. Yeah. It's just the industry continues to evolve and they don't quite know what to call us yet. So different <laughs> right. companies change it and then people have to adapt. Yeah. That's what I was going to, I was another thing I wanted to ask you is what do you think the best descriptor of people who design websites and apps are at this point? Because we've gone through so many iterations and I don't know if we're going to stop uh, on product designer, but curious on your take on, on the current landscape. The most popular job title right now is product designer. I think it is the most encompassing, although it is also the most vague. I get I the idea. Like you kind of need to put digital product designer on the end. <laughs> if you tell anyone um, you're a product designer, they're like, oh, you make like trinkets and things. Like, yeah, which is like traditional industrial design. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's And like, that's why I understand the concept of it because traditionally a product was something tangible that you would buy off of a shelf. And now products, especially with a lot of SaaS applications and like the whole software as a service concept is like, yeah, that is technically a product, right? So like Uber offers a product, which is connecting people to cars to get rides, but there is no physical item there. So designing their app experience is the product that they're providing. Right. However, right. just like your point about calling it digital is like, it's so big that you could be a product designer who's heavy in research. Or you could be a project designer who's heavy in design systems and knowing what your anchor is, is extremely important on how you get that job. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've said before, like the cool thing about the industry is there's not really a gatekeeper in the sense of you have to have a four-year degree from a prestigious place or you have to have a certain certification. So you can like learn it on your own and you can chart your own path but it's hard sure. to know what path is the right path to take or the most expedient path. So it's kind of a, you know, it cuts both ways in, in the industry. But if you, you know, follow the right trail, you can get there and you can get there pretty quick. Yeah, and that's a lot of it. And what I'm doing and why I got into career coaching is working with people who need to figure out like, oh, I just want my first job or I want my first cut or I want my first UX UI designer role. And it's just like, what does that mean to you? <laughs> it's like, and then people start blaming the market. It's like, no, the market is hot. Like the market is really hot. If you can tell a story about who you are, it's relatively easy to get a job. Yeah. I think your point of like, what does that job title mean is super important because when I say UX designer, someone will hear that and they will think, this is purely research and someone is doing exclusively user experience research and it doesn't encompass anything to do with visual design. And another person will hear UX designer and they'll think you design, you know, websites and apps and maybe you just design things with good user experience, best practices, but you know, nothing on the research side. So it's like, this humongous chasm of, of understanding that is kind of evolving. And it's like, you kind of have to clarify with people or with job descriptions, like, what do you mean when you say this? And it can be tricky and kind of confusing if you are, you know, just getting your head into the space. Yeah. Especially people who are really early in their journey want to use the UX slash UI and people who are further along in their journey or like, those are two very different things. Don't put them together, right? So <laughs> understanding like, what is it that you enjoy? And then figuring out how to tell your story around that with the idea that your story is just getting started. And you made a great point about like, you don't need the degrees as much. Unless you want to be a doctor or an attorney, there is not a lot of reasons to keep going down that postgraduate route, right? So yeah. you just need to prove experience. And within our industry, there's a reason why there's so many boot camps and certifications that exist. And all those programs are doing is filling an empty toolbox, but it's up for you to articulate how you use those tools to be effective. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Go, I think 
back to kind of some of your experiences where you had tons of agency experience and a lot of in-house as well. Were there any high points or low points looking back that you would call out and say this moment in time or these moments stuck out to me? Absolutely. There's just, there's a handful. A few that stand out immediately are now what I like to call hug them out sessions. And there was a specific moment where a designer and I were in the room to where he was definitely more of the visual designer and I was more of the architect. And also I like to refer to myself as an architect versus a designer because I don't play with graphics as much as I play with like a traditional blueprint of a building. So I was there as an architect for the experience that we were designing and he was there as a the more visual graphic designer, really artistically talented dude. And we had such a passionate session of trying to figure out what the ideal experience was with two very different angles, but it was at a level of respect that you could feel the energy in the room was electric out of just like two people trying to create something that's ideal for the customer. And then after we both kind of aligned on a solution that we both loved, it was that hug them out moment of like feeling that passion, feeling that energy and that just mutual relationship of like, it's not personal. It's literally about what is on this canvas right now and what are we coming up with that we both couldn't do individually. That's cool. I've, I've so definitely like those, had those sorts of times where it's like yeah. things feel tense and it's sometimes it's a misunderstanding. Sometimes it's like just a different viewpoint. Sometimes it's context and it, it feels like you're on a, a, a make or break moment. And then, you know, hopefully it comes out with a hug it out moment. Those are, <laughs> those are always ideal, but sometimes it's like, well, neither of us agree. So now what? Yeah. Yeah. And that's such an important part about our industry is that when people come across and they're like, hey, Steven, can you give me feedback on my portfolio? What? Like, what do you want to know, right? Like our industry is so general because everybody has an opinion that it's so much easier to give critiques to where you're not looking over the shoulder at a developer and be like, I don't know about the way you wrote that code, buddy. Like that's not because right. no one's going to care as long as it functions. But for us as designers, everybody has an opinion. So it comes down to how good are you at defending your design decisions? Right. And when somebody asks for a portfolio review or feedback without context of what they're trying to achieve, what's to say the feedback is going to be helpful? That's interesting. And that's what I'm hearing a lot of time where people are like, in terms of things like ADP list, where it's like, yeah, it's great. Go talk to a bunch of different people. Go get a bunch of different opinions. If you're new in your career and you don't know the direction you're trying to go, all you're hearing is noise. Yeah, Because somebody who is a researcher is going to be like, you don't have enough information about the research that you did versus the graphic design person is going to be like, I don't really like that color blue. It's like, okay, right. cool. If you don't know where you're trying to go, you don't know what opinion to listen to. Like maybe you hate research and you're like, yeah, I purposely downplayed research because that's not what I want to do in my career. Right, right. I'd be interested in your take in people starting out, whether they try to appear more generalized in that, like, I can do a little bit of research, I can do a little bit of design, or do you think someone should like niche down right away and be like, I am, you know, solely this? Yeah. So are you asking for my opinion or like what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing? <laughs> okay. okay. I would say the, in general, people are trying to be one size fits most. However, I don't think that's helping them. Because what's happening is being one size fits most is equal to hanging out with your friends and just being like, oh yeah, I like listening to music. Good story, bro. Right? Like <laughs> what? <laughs> like, that's not, that's not exciting. That's not interesting. That doesn't have anything to react to. So just being like, oh yeah, I want to be a UX UI designer. It's like one, that's two different things. Two, what do you want to do? So when I work with clients or when I try to give feedback to people, my direction is like, know what your anchor is and then build around that. So you're not niching down right away to say, I'm only a design systems person or I'm only a researcher, but you are able to say, my strengths are within visual graphic design. I enjoy being a part of the research. I enjoy being a part of the interaction design. That's not where I can add the most value. Yeah. And once you know that, once you're able to build your story around that framework, you then become more interesting to the people who are looking to hire somebody with less experience, but needs to know where to start them. Yeah. I think it's tough too, because starting out, it's like, it's like, I don't know. I like all of these things more than my current job or more than like nothing. <laughs> so it's like, I would do research. Truth. I would do design. Yeah. Like I'm a little bit good at all of these things. Like 
it's it, and it almost feels like I need to do this six months hardcore like at a company before I can decide if I like research or if I like design systems. Absolutely. Everybody that I've talked to so far, whenever you're like, great, what did you enjoy doing the most? And they're like, well, I really enjoyed the research, but I wasn't very good at it. It's like, okay, cool. Well, then what do you enjoy is different than what are you currently good at? Like, what's your anchor? So like getting into a company where you're like, hey, I'm good at research, but I really enjoyed the graphic design side. Be transparent about that in the interview process and see if there's an opportunity to add value right away and cross train with the people who are doing other things. Yeah, one, one thing when I interview people, I want them to tell me something that they don't like. Right. So I'm like, sure. So it looks like you've done some research and you've done some design. What's your focus or what do you like the best? And if it's like, oh, I kind of like it all. It's like, eh, wrong answer. I want you to tell me you're good at something. Right. Like, yeah, if I'm going to go out to eat and go get food at just a random place and I'm like, what's good here? And the waiter is like, everything's good. It's like, eh, well, that doesn't help me. Like, yeah, you go to the cheesecake like, factory. Yeah, right. <laughs> I want to know, like, am I going to a burger place because this has the best burgers? Am I going to a pizza place? Like, I want to know specifically what I'm getting myself into. Yeah, I don't want just an average meal. I want you to tell me what I'm here for. Like, I don't yeah. want to waste my time. And the same thing is true with as a designer, if we see ourselves as the product that companies are trying to pay for. Right. So the cliche that I hear is like your salary is your subscription service for this employer. And if you're not adding value anymore, then they're just not going to keep paying you. Right. So like, what are they paying for? And I love that. Like, I love you specifically in your example to where you're like, I want to know what they don't enjoy doing. Which is just as important as what they enjoy doing. However, if you're young in your career, saying no to something might have you feel self-conscious that they're not going to like you. Right, 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 right. And I think it's the same thing as like niching down in a business. It's like we are kind of more niching down into like, and this is still very broad, like B2B apps, right? So that's not to say we won't ever work on B2C products. We really like B2C products. It's just like we feel like that attracts a certain customer to us first yeah. and foremost. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, saying that you prefer you know, design system work or whatever doesn't mean you'll never do research or you'll never be considered for it. It just shows that you are intentional about what you, what you like or what you're good at. Sure. And the same thing is true with me and Career Crutch for Designers. Like it's literally in the name, like I'm coaching designers. However, I do have clients who are not designers. They're not the people that are necessarily targeting, but they're people where they're like, I liked your style. I came across you at whatever location, or they might've been in my personal network from before. And like, I like who you are and how you're going about it. And I want your point of view to help me through my journey. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I'm not going to go out and pursue that because being one size to everybody is not going to work. But knowing that it's like for designers, by designers, I use the design process on ourselves, right? So like, I'm not using industry related coaching terms. It's like, no, we're going to want a discovery. We're going to do a design of our story. We're going to craft that, right? Like those are things that I know and people like that, even though they're not necessarily my target audience. Totally. Yeah, that's cool. In a minute here, we'll get into kind of your process for that. But also wanted to kind of see over your time in large and small companies, is there any particular industry or size of company that you particularly enjoy doing UX at or particularly didn't enjoy UX at? Yeah, I'll, I'll give an example of both. So specifically, let's start with the ones that I didn't enjoy. The ones that I don't enjoy. So I spent a lot of time in the financial industry. And in that space, there's so much more red tape because yeah. of the legalities at stake that it's like, okay, cool. But you also feel like you have to get everybody and their mom to approve something. And there's so many more people who want to say no than those who are willing to own the risk. Right? Yes. So I like- Just talking with someone- who worked at a bank for a few years in, in UX and they're like, I will never do that again. Like it was just so many hierarchies of decision-making and yeah. so much red tape. And it's like, I think there's a certain person who can thrive in that, but you have to be like, okay with significantly delayed gratification and lots Absolutely. of things. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. It's the lack of sense of urgency. It's just like, if you're somebody who wants to just kind of coast in a stable income that's definitely 
guaranteed, right? Like these massive banks are like, yeah, they're not going anywhere. I mean, look what happened in 2008, right? Like they're not going anywhere. And it's like, if you want a stable income where it's maybe a less stress situation and you're worried about like, you have a family and kids and you want to be able to be off at five o'clock so you can be home. Like, yeah, that's a perfect place for you to comfortably hang out a little bit. Yep. Uh, and I might be at that spot in my career eventually. That's just not who I am now. Yep. And then the counter to that is like the places where maybe the agency world to me was the most fun because you're in a space where you're usually put on three to six month projects. You just come in, do really cool work and then move on to the next project. So you get a chance to get exposure to a lot of different companies of all different sizes. And you're seen instantly as an expert because they're hiring you versus this like in-house team that they like don't get along with or the marketing people is difficult to work with or the tech guys take too long. So they outsource it. So you come in with instant authority and an opinion where you're like, cool, help me understand your problem. Help me understand what you're trying to achieve. And then let's work together to get there. Yeah. It's also interesting because like in-house team, there's probably, I would say a sense a more of a sense of politics and you have to kind of know how to navigate the waters, whether in your team or above your team. When if an agency comes in, they can kind of come in and be a little bit more blunt and specific about the strengths and the and the weaknesses of, you know, whatever existing platform might be there. And it's probably less personal, right? Because you don't have to go in there to make everyone your friends. You're in there to do good work, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's definitely that balance of making sure that you have your single point of contact because you're going to get a bunch of opinions and right. you're able to be like, cool, make a decision. Like I'll wait here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. I, I think one of the things I liked about running an agency and, and working in agencies is kind of that shiny light bulb syndrome where it's like, this is fun. I need to do something new. I want to try something else. I want to move on to the next thing and always kind of having an endpoint or something else you can switch to and knowing that something else exciting might come up, I think is good for certain people's brains and, and work styles. Yeah, absolutely. And just to devil's advocate a little bit to not feel like agencies are the only best place to be because <laughs> I get that question a lot, right? So agencies are fun. However, after a certain amount of time, you're doing the same thing just for different brands. So like, I can't tell you how many website redesigns I had to do for large corporations, which the first couple are really fun. And then after a while, you're just like, right. okay, cool. I can just put your logo and you have the same problems, right? right. Like change right. the colors. So you then have to reassess the projects to make your job more entertaining, even though the client's going to be happy with what you did for the last client, because that's why they hired you. Right. So right. agency world does get tedious depending on what the diversity of your project load becomes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it can, it can also feel kind of like an endless treadmill, like. Yeah. You're just, you're always going, always churning in. And a lot of times you don't have the space to just like sit and think about something for a long time. Like you yeah. be in product team or, a, a, you know, a bank where it's like, sit and think about this for half the day and that have a time to kind of plan to put something together for the stakeholders or something like that. Sure. And in-house it's because you're in more on like a read, like you're there all the time. So you're the same brand. So you can deep think about stuff and you can get into depth of things that the agency world, like they're not going to pay you to do necessarily. So it's like, yeah, okay. I'll have 10 conversations about an accessibility constraint that we solved last week, but you have to go on this road show to get everybody else to see how it's been solved in order to like right. play that game. <laughs> Nice. And I literally would call it the roadshow when I was in house. I'm like, cool, we have a solution. Now we just have to go on the roadshow to get approvals <laughs> because yeah. that's basically what it is. It's like you spent half your time talking about the work that you already did. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, yeah, I felt like the, the deadlines and things like when I was in house versus agency was like drastically different. Like agency, it was like, we need this in an hour and a half. Yeah. In-house was like, it'd be great if you get this to us by next month. Yeah. And you'd be like, like, do you think that's doable? You're like, yes, I can have it to you by Wednesday. Like, <laughs> so it's just, it, it's just a different pace. And at least yeah. like where I was at, I know there's certainly in-house teams that move incredibly fast, but sure. it's one of those things where if you want to marinate on something, think about something, do a bunch of iterations on it. It's like, 
that's a bigger opportunity at an in-house shop. Yeah, sure. definitely, definitely depends on the company, but I had a similar experience to where I have a funny quote from a colleague of mine from a company I used to work for. He's like, when I first started here, I heard like two years to launch a project. I was like, man, that seems like forever. And then now that I've been here for three years and I haven't launched anything, I was like, well, that was pretty aspirational. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. So I know you spoke a little bit about this in the beginning, but how did you come to realize that you wanted to get out of actually doing the design work into more specifically coaching people? Sure. So that was a fun journey to talk about. So as I kind of hinted at, I've always been a teacher or an instructor or a speaker my entire life. Like 15 and a half, my first job was teaching swim lessons. And then from there, like I've always been involved with some sort of paying my knowledge forward, mentoring on the side, like being involved in different programs. And then as I climbed my way up the corporate ladder, last August is when I kind of really made the decision, but it started in like June. I went through this journey of just like, okay, I'm not enjoying my day to day anymore. What do I really like? And what I loved most, and it's always clear through the thread of my journey, is that ability to productize my knowledge and pay it forward. And through that, with coaching and helping in the design space, I've learned and figured out how to be successful as a designer. From moving from Seattle to Kansas City to Virginia, and then back to the best coast, California, I didn't have an, a network at the time when I did those moves. So I had to learn how to tell my story build connections and get a job in each of those five states. And that's four states, the fifth state where I was originally born in Oregon. So I've lived in five states. Uh, <laughs> so like, but they're doing that. I was like, oh yeah, I got that. And then also I was able to climb the corporate ladder faster than a lot of other people who have been doing it for years. And the real differentiator was I wasn't afraid to ask for what I wanted and continue to kind of advocate for what I want to do next. With traditionally people who have been around for a long time feel almost tenured or duped for the promotion because they've been there a while. And then they're sitting there looking at me to be like, what is this guy doing? Like, why is he getting this success? It's like, well, I was transparent about what I wanted and I advocated for that. And those are different characteristics that I took for granted at the time and have since been able to reflect and watch other people succeed off of the knowledge that I was able to share with. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Curious about, you know, when you say you weren't enjoying your day to day anymore, was that like kind of a result of just doing the same thing for so many years and just kind of being bored by the work at some point or, or was it another factor? It was a combination of both of those. One of them I've been like, as we're talking about the agency world, like you can only solve the problem so many times. So I kind of got tired of doing that. But the real thing that burned me out in the director role, because society tells you to climb the corporate ladder. So I did that. And then I just realized that at a certain altitude, you're not a designer at all. You're just dealing with politics all the time. And it was just like having to convince my boss why I needed more people to get hired on my team, but we didn't have headcount. Having to play politics with product partners about who aren't getting their work done because we don't have headcount to prioritize their work versus everybody else's work. So it's like this constant roadshow of like what I enjoyed most was the one-on-one -on -one conversations with my team and trying to figure out like, okay, what do you want to do in your career and how do we help set you up for success? Sure, sure. And that was the thing that I held on to because the rest of it was just like, just listen to me, man. Like I've defended why I need this headcount, but then he believes me and then he has to go to his leadership and get approval. And then they have to talk about budget. And you're just like, all right, cool. I'm still bleeding out, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. So looking back to you, kind of wish you had stayed at like the contributor level or like the manager level versus being more of that, that middle, middle management, I guess you could say. Uh, no, cause I don't regret it at all. Yeah. Right. Like I definitely feel that sense of a bucket list person of like, I want to know what that was like. So I yeah, know yeah. what I'm saying no to. So now what I'm doing, like when I left corporate America in August, officially, like when I started interviewing and then found my job, I picked up a job as an IC as a contractor, as an individual contributor, just cause it's like, I want to do the craft and only think about the craft and not have to do anything else. And that's a like a, a key landing spot for me while I focus on this coaching business. Yeah. So yeah. I've been coaching forever, but I want to turn this coaching business into a primary source of income and it's going to take time. So as a designer, 
I'm using that process on myself as well towards like, okay, my constant is still my craft of a designer. How do I do that well in a place that I enjoy going to work every day, which is exactly where I landed in order to be able to be transparent and endorse what I'm trying to do for my future. Yeah. Which is yeah. growing this coaching business in a way that like other people can benefit from knowledge and experience that people are finding helpful from me that I might have taken for granted at the time. Sure. Yeah. So maybe we can kind of dive into your plan for, you know, launching your coaching career and kind of your strategy around how you think you can most effectively help people in that. Yeah, absolutely. So what I've been able to find through feedback of my clients is what I'm doing is like, I've been a designer my entire career. So for designers, by designers, how do I help designers be successful? And as we were talking about, like the world of product design is super vague and not all coaches who don't have industry knowledge can differentiate them. So what I'm able to do as somebody who has experience in the field and kind of knows how these different roles play together, I'm able to now work with clients to one, uh, figure out what they want to do in this space. So then we can start pursuing the right role for them. And the way that I do that is using the design process on ourselves and treating ourselves as the product. So if you see yourself as a product that people want to pay for, similar to our conversation where it's like, oh, if you want to go to a restaurant, it's like, cool, I'm hungry. What do you want to eat? Food. Like you're going to make everybody frustrated, right? So it's like, cool, you're a designer. What do you want to do? Just design stuff to get experience. Yeah. And those are the people who are complaining about not being able to find a job. Right. Self-reflection in a way towards like, oh yeah, because you're not interesting and I don't know what I'm paying for. I'm going to hire the other person. Like what you're saying in the interview process, you want to know what they don't want to do just as much as you want to know what they do want. Right. And it's so, hard for people to feel confident in that. So that's what I'm trying to work through that to understand. Yeah. Who is like your target client? My target client are individual contributors who are wanting to be in the design space at whatever level of their career. I have clients who are straight out of a boot camp. I have clients who are about to graduate college. So I would say those are like earlier in their UX journey. But even if you're straight out of a boot camp, you're generally sitting on years of experience that's transferable and they don't know how to reframe that. So people who are starting off in their UX journey is a target client. I also work with people who are close to retirement. So I have this one woman who's like 10 years away from retirement, has worked in the same company most of her career. So she just doesn't have a portfolio, doesn't really know how to productize herself, but knows that she's not making as much money as she can. So it's like, okay, well, you're 10 years out of retirement. Like you're clearly super attractive, but because you've never spent time telling your story to find a new job, we need to figure that out. Right. Yeah. So like what has made her attractive and how does she go make a bunch of money for the last 10 years of her career? Yeah. yeah. And then everything so, in between that, I also have a lot of people who are just like, I feel like I've been doing this for five to 10 years. So I should be a senior level person. I just don't know what a senior level person is supposed to look like. So how do we figure out what that bracket looks like. As long as they want to stay in the individual contributor route and not the management path, that's who I'm targeting. Cool. Very cool. I do have a few people who are going the management path, but because I've done that and I don't like it, I feel like it's somewhat hypocritical for me to say like, oh yeah, let me tell you how to do this thing when it's not something that I feel loyal about. And when I have people who want to go the management path, they're like, yeah, Steven, I trust you. I know you. I understand that you don't love this and you're willing to embrace who I am and what I'm trying to do in a way that's like, okay, I'll help you get there. I'm just not going to tell you like why it's awesome as much as maybe being an IC. Yeah. So I think for a lot of our listeners out there, they are kind of in that younger UX journey where they're either switching careers to something more UX focused, or they're trying to get into their first actual UX job. I know we've talked about it a bit, but do you have any kind of just like high level strategic thoughts as to like what you should do or what you shouldn't do at face value for finding your first UX job? Yeah, so absolutely. Let's start with the things you should do. So there are four key aspects that anybody wants to know about something that they're about to hire. So what you should do, number one is figure out who you are. So like being able to tell your story in a way that's like your elevator pitch, like what is your superpower? How are your skills transferable? That kind of thing. The second thing people need to know how to do is explain what they do. So we talked about how boot camps and programs fill an empty toolbox, figuring out how to be able to explain to somebody what's in your toolbox. 
is super important. So the question that I generally ask when I was a hiring manager is what's your design process? And if you cannot confidently answer that question, we have concerns. Yes. <laughs> I understand that you're not going to use every tool in your toolbox all the time. However, without knowing that you have that tool, I'm going to assume you don't. Right. The third thing people need to show is how do they use the tools? So that's what people generally refer to as case studies. I talk about them as being work samples because a case study usually has an outcome. And if all you're showing me are samples of your work from your bootcamp program or maybe a freelance project, they're not case studies, they're work samples. But the purpose of those work samples is just to be able to show me how you use your toolbox effectively. And that goes back to what type of job you want yeah, to get. Absolutely. Like show me work samples of the work you want to do. Don't show me a project where you're like, yeah, let me show you this project that I actually didn't like at all and not work I ever want to do. And then act like it didn't exist. Right? Like. I'm not going to tell you about how I took like babysitting jobs because that's not relevant to the job that I want to do now, <laughs> right? Like, so show me two to three work samples of work that you want to do so I can see you doing that work on my team. And like, if you really want to do research, if you really want to do design system stuff, like emphasize those projects and emphasize those parts of that project in the framework of what your design process is. Specifically for my journey, I don't see myself as a designer. I see myself as an architect. So in my design process, I purposely broke out a phase that said architecture, and that's where I showed boxes and arrows, site maps, user flows, wireframes, like all the lower level fidelity architecture, strategic thinking. And then I differentiated that from the design process where I might've shown higher graphic quality content. Sure. In a way to where it's like, this is where my sweet spot is. Sure. Sure. Uh, and then the fourth thing that people need to show is closing the deal with that contact information. So like, how can I reach you? Which is obviously something that's like somewhat of a no brainer, but we need to name that because it's equally as important as the other three pieces. It's just not going to be as deep, right? Like you're not going to have a really long scrolling contact page as, might, as much as you might have like a really long scrolling, what's your design process? Sure, 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 sure. This might be a little tangent, but in the how to contact you, I come across a lot of like resumes or even like portfolio sites where they'll have links to, you know, maybe it's like Dribbble or Instagram or Twitter or wherever. And some of them like don't work or they go to a profile that's like not there. And that's kind of funny to me. And then I don't know, I, I'd be curious to, from your perspective, from like a hiring manager perspective, do you take into consideration the type of things that you see like outside of work? Like, does this person have like a crazy social media that's like, uh, you know, not like they're going to be a journalist and you need to know everything about them. But have you ever like seen a really good candidate and something outside of say their like resume or something like completely threw you off and like downgraded their, you know, their perception of, of being able to be a good UX designer on the team? Uh, I haven't specifically related to that topic. I feel like you talked about two different things. And we'll get to both. So the, the yeah. last part of just like, I, I have not personally came across somebody in a way to where I'm like, Ugh, what they said on Twitter is sketchy for my, like for what we're trying to hire. I don't really see that. I expect that that usually gets, like that usually gets vetted by somebody at some point, sure. right? Like that's not necessarily what I'm paying attention to as a potential hiring manager to be like, are they going to be helpful on my team? Those aspects of like, oh, they're potentially involved with other things. I hope that would be vetted, not before it got to me, but, but like that's what recruiters and like those types of teams are, hopefully responsible sure. for is like making sure that they're at least a good like person. Uh, All right. The other thing that you talked about though, that was interesting of like having either broken links or the wrong social media tool. Like you see what, like people use website builder tools. Fantastic. Do it. Highly recommend it. Right. Like if you want to use Squarespace, if you want to use Webflow, if you want to use UX Folio, do it because I'm not trying to hire you as a web developer. So I'm not caring about the quality of your code. However, if you choose to use one of those tools, pay attention to every part of the tool that you're the theme that you're picking, because there are social media sites on there that will link you to Webflow's Twitter account. When right. on your contact page, it just has like a Twitter icon. You're like, well, I didn't update it because I don't have a Twitter account that I want to attach to my personal brand. It's like, cool. Well, then you better make sure that it's turned off. Right. Well, I think the other thing about that is completely agree with you on like the website doesn't have to be the best developed website ever. One thing I see is like, if you have one of those things and it has the extension of the service you're using, like, you know, dot Weebly or dot Wix, like your name dot whatever, it's like, 
downgrade you a little bit in in just perception like get your own domain right like show that you want the extra mile to like actually invest in getting something that's not the free tool that like you're invested enough to like at least care about having your own domain yeah that's an interesting topic that i get asked occasionally of just like do you judge people differently if they don't have the custom domain i agree with you like i definitely it doesn't go unnoticed, but it's not going to be a decision maker for me, but it's definitely going to be something where it's like, right. hmm, okay, they're on a budget or they're just like choosing not to right. do it. Like I'm not <laughs> going to pass on them right away, but I'm definitely going to notice that and continue to review the rest of it. But I would agree. It, it right. starts off as like a negative one versus like a zero. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's like hooking up a DNS, you know, the DNS records to your domain is not hard. No one's ever done it until they've done it. And it kind of takes a little bit of figuring out. So it's like, oh, okay, this person at least like was able to figure out this obscure yeah, process yeah. that they've never done before. And they care a little bit more about their personal brand, maybe. I don't know. So I, it yeah, could I be it's, that. But to me, it's also like, I see it potentially as a budgetary thing to where like, maybe they don't have the extra $20 a month, which is like, then I'm really trying to gauge like, where are they coming from to where it's like, okay, sure. if they're a working professional who's sitting on years of experience and they seem to be still employed and they're making a transition, that's different than just like, oh, they've clearly been unemployed for like two years. And it's right, like, right. okay, I'm going to consider that because I want to give There's you the benefit of the doubt, but I'm also like noticing. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't go unnoticed. Let's just say that much. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. So we've talked a little bit about case studies and things like that. And like, Totally agree with you. You know, you should form your case studies to kind of be positioning the work that you want to do. Is there a particular like downfall or criticism that you would give to like most case studies that you come across? Yes. Most case studies that I come across are presented as a to do list of things that they've done versus the cause and effect of each step of the process. I think it's really hard to get the cause and the, and the effect, right? It's like, I'll just show my process. I think, you know, I did this. I was able to effectively do this. I did this hard thing. And it's like, cool, you did that thing. What did that yield? And yeah, a lot of why, why do I care? Right away. Yeah. Yeah. To where it's, to me, it's like, yes, if you're coming out of a program, I trust that you've learned the toolbox, right? We've talked about that analogy a lot. But being able to show, based off of the five interviews that I did, I got these findings, so it led to this sitemap. Or it led to this user flow. And then based off of the content audit that I did or the competitive analysis that I did, these were the themes that inspired how I laid out the page, right? It's like most people are like, I have personas. I did a sitemap. I have low fidelity wireframes. You're like, cool, you did the process in chronological order. High five. Like, what, <laughs> what, why does that matter? Like, what did you learn from that previous step? And don't tell me that you did anything, but just tell me like one or two sentences that you interviewed five key stakeholders and got these key results that inspired what you did next. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I see when I'm evaluating portfolios is like a lot of things that I see is just like, wow, you have way too much writing on here. Like, I would not read this whole thing if I was paid to. Like, there's just way too much stuff on here yeah, for me to even, yeah. like, begin to read. Sure. Yeah, that's um, that gets into the to-do list aspect of things to where people just want to talk about what they did. And it's just like, because I, I, I've never read any of those verbatim either. Scanning them, though, you're looking for specific context. And you're like, okay. Yeah. I, and, like, they'll say, I did this thing, like, in, like, after doing the personas, then I did the sitemap. The sitemap was done through using this tool where I was able to move these boxes. And you're just like, cool. Why do I care? Right? Like, did a sitemap that architects the five key pillars of the experience to allow people to do X. Boom. Move on. Right? Like, that's all I want to know. I don't want to know that. And then I worked with this person to do this thing. And then they talked to their person. And then we talked to this and got feedback here. You're like, great. This isn't a story, dude. It is. It's just like, give me the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> this isn't a book. Right. Yeah. Or a novel. I would really be interested in your perspective on if you think that there is an easier entry point 
based on skill set. So do you think it's easier to get into a, a research side of UX versus more of the UI side of things? If you're looking just for kind of the entry level first job. I love that question. I'm going to think about it. I definitely think that there is a ranking in terms of like, which ones might be the easiest to get into. The reason why I paused was because my brain is going to what's probably the least difficult thing to put somebody into. And I would say research is probably one of the most complicated fields to trust somebody to be just thrown in to conduct research. They might be hired as maybe a research admin and do a little bit more like, I think it's called like a apprentice or whatever. An admin is a different field altogether, but like that space I think is hardest to break into because of how much more complexities go into the logistics and execution of any type of research. The roles that I feel like would be the easiest to break into if I had to put money on it would be more of those entry level design heavy roles. Yeah. Because of that space, it's like you can use design software. If we had a solid enough design system, you become a li- like putting other Lego pieces. And like even getting somebody in the design systems field is like easier to get your feet wet in the design systems because you're working with just building components without necessarily having to own how the entire experience is connected. Yeah. So I, if we were to rank them. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think it's also really hard to validate or compare like research to sure. You can, I mean, you can see like, oh, you should have done more or less. But for people who are like, I did the research is like, cool. I assumed you didn't lead the responder in like asking them bad questions. Yeah. It's like, there's a lot of assumptions and there's, it's really hard to differentiate yourself as a researcher, especially sure. if you have no previous history. It's like, okay, you talked to these people, you did this thing, you got this outcome. Like, I can't say if it was like good or bad research. It's harder to evaluate than seeing someone's like, this person clearly has like visual design chops and I can look at their Figma file and I can say like, yes, your visual design is great. And the way that you built these things is to best practices. Like that's very easy to verify. And you could also get more around their rationale and decision-making process in their designs to where it's like, I might, to our earlier topic about like, is it a good design or not? I can't tell you that without knowing the rationale. So being able to say like, oh, why did you make yeah. these decisions? And if the response I get is because I thought it looked good, that's not as strong as like based off of the research that I found or that I acquired or based off the competitive analysis or based off of feedback that I got. Like this is where I started and this is where we ended. And this isn't ever done, but like this is what we had to do within the time constraint. Like that yeah. stronger rationale for me to be like, okay, they're wanting data informed decisions and not just like, oh, it just worked for me. You're like, great. Well, it doesn't work for me next. <laughs> it's, <laughs> right. it's, not as, it's not as powerful as a, as a decision. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Cool, cool. So we talked about the four things that you should do when interviewing or what people want to know. I think you sure. also said you had some ones that you remembered that you shouldn't do when you're applying for jobs or looking for your first hire, what would your suggestions be on that end? So a few things that people should not do when they're trying to go for a role is one, number one, don't apply to everything that simply has the job titles that you think are interesting because you're wasting your time and everybody else's when you do that. So being able to know like, okay, if you're applying as a product designer who's heavy on visual design, don't apply for the research jobs. Don't apply for the UX jobs that seem to talk more logistics, right? Like, and you, you, your response is like, yeah, no, done. That is still a thing where people are like, but you never know. And it's like, that you're just, wait, unless you have like a quota to hit, because some, I know some boot camps have this like 90 day guarantee if you apply for five jobs a day or whatever, then it's like, great, easy apply for the three that aren't worth your time and then spend your time on the ones that are like actually. Right. Uh, so that's number one is like, make sure you're applying for the right type of jobs. Number two, in terms of things that you don't want to do is I would say the perfect example of what you already brought up, right? Like 
have a point of view. So don't just try to be that one size fits most style. So as much as like you should have a perspective and an angle to go after, you should also the opposite of that. Like, don't just try to say yes to things. Cause as much as you think you're trying to be accommodating, you're also talking yourself away from them being interested in. Yep. You're deluding yourself. Yeah. Deluding is the right. Yeah. That's a way better word. <laughs> so that would be number two. And then people love rounding things off in threes. I would say the third thing that you should not do is that concept of just assuming you applied for the job is all you need to do. So the aspect of follow-up and connections and prepping and trying to figure out like, okay, do you have an answer to the standard questions that people would expect to get? Or do you have a potential in on that company where you can have somebody give a referral or a recommendation, right? So in terms of not to do, don't just assume that clicking the easy apply button on LinkedIn, playing the numbers game is going to get you the job. Like I've only applied to design systems jobs. So I did that. It's like, that. Well, then you're also not differentiating yourself in a way to where it's right. like advocate for what you want, ask for what you want, let people know what you want, and then allow that kind of putting it out into the universe type of word of mouth help you. Yes, I, I completely agree. I would say if you, if you feel like you're self-aware enough and you have a, a good portfolio and you just, you really just need to get in, in front of the right person and you're just easy applying and for whatever reason it's not working, I would say do the easy apply, reach out to whoever in the company that you can find online that is relevant, whether it's the design team manager, whether it's hiring manager, whether it's CTO, whatever, and maybe find them on LinkedIn, find them on Twitter, find their email in their LinkedIn profile and send them a under five minute loom explaining why you think you're really good for this position. And Ooh. as long as your portfolio or your pitch isn't absolutely horrible, you will surpass most people in the application process. You'll use a back door. You will go the extra mile. You'll give them something that they can sink their teeth into. And that, if nothing else, that is the cheat code that can at least get you noticed. Yeah. At least get you shortlisted on somebody's like, oh, I want to talk to this person. I don't know if they're good or not yet. But you're at least getting in that door in a maybe a little bit more elevated way. Exactly. Because the, the thing with the easy apply is like, yeah, it, that cuts both ways too, because it's like, oh, this is easy. I can apply. But it's like, yeah, so can every other, you know, million UX designers trying to find a job in a sea of, you know, hundreds or maybe even thousands of applicants. Like, how are you going to stand out? You're just hoping that you applied when someone logged in to see the most recent applicants. And that's going to be tricky. And you got to differentiate yourself in some sort of way. And another way to add to what you were just saying in terms of, yes, pursue the people in the company. Absolutely. Another thing to add to that, like exposure is trying to get involved with just people who know other people, right? So this game isn't a who, you know, we all know a bunch of famous celebrities, but that doesn't help us at all. The game is who knows you and how do they know you? So through playing that, like specifically with the clients that I work with, it's like, look, I'm connected to recruiters around the country and a few outside of the continental United States is like, okay, now that I know who you are and I'm willing to put my personal clout behind you, I will make introductions. Like I had a client yesterday who was like, hey, Steve, I'm really fed up with my current job. I think we're ready to go. I'm going to quit in a couple of weeks and then like I'm going to start applying. And I was like, great. I believe in you now. We've been working together for three months. Your brand is perfectly ready to go. And I introduced her to five other recruiters and was like, hey, what work do you have? Because staffing recruiting agencies, their job is to help you find a job with the right fit. So don't just assume that they're working for you. They're working for their clients who hopefully you line up with. So being able to be like, great, I have this fantastic person now who I'm willing to put my clout behind. And now they know that she exists, right? And they're able to help try to find her a job in that regard. To where people talk about the like exactly. hidden job yeah. market, which I don't think is actually a thing. The job market is very public because everybody wants to find the first person, that they, like the best person for the job. But it's that game of like, who knows you? And with those introductions, I don't know a specific right. role, but I know that this person is quality and I know that this recruiter is quality and you should know each other, right? Like it's being a connector. Yeah. And that's what I love to do yeah. is connecting people. 
warm introductions will also get you to the, you know, to someone's short list. Not yeah. that it work out every time, but you can meet people, have connections. I've had instances where I've been introduced to people just because I have slightly interacted with someone on Twitter before. And we kind of feel like friends. And they'll be like, hey, I'm looking for this type of person to do this project. A friend is looking for someone to do this type sure. of project. And I've had a little bit of interaction and they feel comfortable at least making an email intro, right? Sure. So it's like, we don't have to like have coffee with this person every Thursday and be super good friends with them. It's just like, just a little knowledge of who you are out there. Absolutely. Can really get you some intros. And it's only going to continue to grow as long as you realize that you're an ad. Like, so something that my most influential mentor, who I still talk to this day, and I haven't worked for him for a long time, but he taught me the concept of always build advocates for yourself. And that premise has stayed with me, obviously, until this moment. Never knowing what you're going to do in your life and how and when these different relationships might come full circle to you, that idea of always building advocates, that always show up consistently, always be nice and kind to people will pay off. Whether like exactly with you, like you were kind to somebody on Twitter and then it potentially got you more business, right? So just like that, just be genuine, realize that every relationship is a human trying to live their best life and all you can do is be supportive. Yep. I love that. I think that's great. One last burning question I have for you is what should someone do if they have no portfolio and they don't have a job? and they are trying to get into the, the field, what should they do? What knowledge do they have so far? Let's I'm asking, I'm asking your question with a question to really define this persona. Yes, yes. Let's say that they have been studying UX design for six months and they, they know how to use some tools. They know how to do the things, but no one will give them a job and they haven't been able to land any big projects. Did they take a program or are they self-taught let's say self-taught okay or or let's assume they went through a program but they didn't get a portfolio out of it let's assume so i'm gonna if you're okay with this let's assume this person did the google coursera ux program which is yeah. relatively self-taught the lowest caliber of programs that maybe exist but because it has google's name on it they instantly assume they have way more credibility than others is that, yeah, I'm Let's leading on purpose, but that. that's what, so if, if our target persona to summarize, our target persona is somebody who just wrapped up the Google Coursera certification, which is relatively a self-taught, self-led program. The instruction is done on the course and the feedback that you get is from other students who are also taking the course, which is scary to people in the industry because you're basically having the blind leave the blind to try to help these people <laughs> learn a skill set that they, none of them really have. Do you agree with that before I assume too much? Do you agree with that narrative? Um, I am not entirely familiar with that program, but if it's how you describe it, then yes, I would agree. Okay. I probably jumped to a few assumptions, but in general, that's how the program is written. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So if that's the person, what I would recommend you do, and I've had a few free consults with people who want to potentially work with me and I delayed working with them. I wouldn't say I turned them away because I'm not going to turn them away, but it was in sorts like, I don't feel like you are ready to work with me yet because of the experiences that they have so far. I'm not here to teach you the skills. I'm here to help you refine your story. So when I have those conversations, what I recommend for them to do is to get as much hands-on exposure to projects with clients who have the ability to give them feedback uh, and things they're doing that. So Tech Fleet is an extremely well run program by a guy named Morgan. But he currently lives in Portland now, but techfleet.org is, I believe, the site. There is also a few other apprenticeship type programs that exist. So getting involved with those programs to where, yes, you are working for free. However, they have real clients, they have real work, and you're getting real exposure. So doing that first will get you a little bit more exposure and instant like trust from a potential hiring manager that isn't just you in a vacuum by yourself with your own opinions and everything that you create is awesome because no one's there to tell you that they don't like the color that you chose. Uh, right. So number one would be getting exposure through those types of projects. The second thing that I'd recommend you start to do is also 
putting yourself out there in a way that I bet your family, your friends, your family, friends, whatever, just wants the internet and they don't really know what they're asking for. So they're willing to just like hire you to build them a website. So you can get a little bit of money that way, potentially you get a heck of a lot of exposure because you're not in a program like tech fleet where they're setting you up for success, but you're by yourself to try to get a little bit more scrap and you can yep. throw together a relatively easy website for your buddy's band. They're going to love that they have a website and you are learning how to put these pieces together, how long it takes you to really do something when you have to go back and forth with somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Those are really good. I'd be interested to hear your take on what do you think about just doing fake projects for yourself? I don't like it. I don't like it at all. The reasons why I don't like it primarily, number one, it's throwaway work that doesn't add value to anybody but yourself, right? So like if you do your buddy's band website, now your buddy has a website and you have portfolio content. So like it's a win-win for both of you. If you find a local nonprofit that you're involved in and they need web help, you're paying it forward. So like that aspect of like not doing throwaway work is one reason. The second thing of like doing on projects for yourself is that that whole idea of you're in your own little space. So like it's how you want to make decisions. It's how you want to design something. It's how you want to use the tool. And yes, knowing how to use Figma right now sounds really interesting and exciting. Five to 10 years from now, who knows if that's going to be the tool. So what we want to hire when I've been in that position, and you could probably relate to this, we want to hire skill set and thought process and not software. Because the software is going to change because what was Photoshop and then Axer and Sketch and Figma and whatever else might come in the future. It's just like asking a carpenter to like the hammers that our grandparents use are probably different than the hammers that exist at the hardware store now. The outcome is still the same. Sure. Yeah. I think that's really good. That's some really good perspective. I think, again, there's that piece of like, maybe they uh, don't have the means to go and find project work or do free work. And I think there is something to be said about just honing your skill by either copying or doing a different version or a take on something that is throwaway work, because it's just kind of like practice. It's like recipes. But I think to your point of like, there's certain things that are like, case studies and certain things that are just like work samples, right? It's just like a different category of something. It's like, maybe it shows competency, but it doesn't show that you worked with people to come to like the solution of a problem type of deal. And that's a lot of the kind of backlash, I guess I hear of people who maybe are more critical of bootcamp programs is that whole idea of like, you're not getting to do projects end to end all the time in the in the real world to be cliche about it, right? So like most of the time, if you get hired as a designer, you're not gonna be given a blank canvas. You're gonna be like, oh, this component already exists. We need to make it better based off of these new requirements that the product team has thrown at you. So like you're having to go in and figure out how other people work, having to assess the problem, having to kind of triage it yourself in a way that it's like, yeah, it's not glamorous. But even when you do agency work and they're brought in to like give you a website redesign, you still have to really assess the current state and what doesn't work before you can make it better. Yep. Where the classroom experience is like, here's a blank canvas, go find a problem and then figure out how you want to solve okay. it. It's like, right, right, right. right. You're not right. generally given that freedom most of the time. So these programs don't do a good job of teaching like, hey, so-and-so left last week because he just got a new job somewhere else. So we had to backfill that position. Here is his shared drive of Figma files. Can you make these changes for us? And like, that's more (laughs) reality. (laughs) That's so true. That's so true. Wow. Well, Stephen, we have had a great talk. I I feel like we could probably talk for another hour, but thank you so much for sharing all of your, your knowledge and advice and history. And we wish you nothing but the best. And thank you so much for uh, coming on. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate this, Seth. This has been great. Thank you. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today on the Product Design Podcast. If you enjoyed our conversation, be sure and go follow our guests. Let them know they did a great job and you learned a lot. Um, More to come in the following weeks as we bring on new guests. Please hit that subscribe button so that you will get these podcasts uh, and learn a ton about the product design community. Excited to see you next time. Thanks.